Before this video gets started, if you like how I present information in this video and you think you might be interested in some math or physics tutoring, I offer Skype tutoring. There's a link in the description for more information. Cool, let's get started. What's going on, smart people? Today I'm showing you an example of how to find the Green's function of an operator where the function is subject to some boundary conditions. Let's get started, guys. Today we're going to be finding the Green's function of the operator d squared over dx squared. And that's, so let's call that operator O. And this is going to be acting on some function, and that function is going to be subject to the boundary conditions where its independent variable x is going to be ranging from, let's go from 0 to pi, and we're going to assume periodic boundary conditions. So the function evaluated at the boundary should be the same, and we're going to make that value equal 0. So we'll let f of 0 equal f of pi equal 0. Cool, let's go ahead and get started. So if this is just a regular old differential equation, we would usually write this as d squared dx squared acting on f of x is equal to some other function that we can call p of x. The whole beauty of the Green's function is that we can change this differential equation to solve for the Green's function instead, and it'll help us calculate the f of x regardless of what this p of x is. So what I'm saying here is, uh, since the Green's function is, in a sense, sort of the inverse of the operator, we can write that f of x is equal to the integral of g of xy, where g of xy is our Green's function, times p evaluated at y dy. And uh, so this is our explicit way of finding out what f of x is. And the cool thing about Green's functions is once we've found it, we find the Green's function based off of the operator and the boundary conditions. It doesn't actually really matter what p of x is. So if we found the Green's function for the operator and those boundary conditions, we've solved a whole class of problems, a whole family of problems, where this p of x might be a little bit different. So that's why even though Green's functions can be pretty difficult to find, you get so much out of it because you've simultaneously solved a whole bunch of problems, assuming you can compute this integral at the end. Uh, the next question is, well, how do you find the Green's function? The Green's function is defined such that the operator acting on it should just spit out a delta function. Okay, and our operator here is just the second order differential. So what we have is we have, we're really just changing one second order differential equation into another that we're solving. So what we're going to end up solving today is d squared dx squared acting on g of xy equal to a delta function. So we're looking for the Green's function such that when we take its second derivative, it should spit out the delta function. And this Green's function should satisfy the same boundary conditions as our function f of x, since we're not making any assumptions about, since this should work for any p of x. So we want to solve a differential equation that is equal to a delta function. What that means is we're going to have to solve two differential equations, really, one for both sides of the crease, so to speak, because for x greater than y and x less than y, this delta function just goes to zero. Something funky happens, obviously, at x equal to y, but we'll get to that. So we want to solve two differential equations. If it's second order, a differential equation is going to have two constants of integration. So we're solving two of them, which means we're going to have four constants of integration to solve for. Now, as of right now, we only have two boundary conditions. That means that we need two more conditions in order to find all of those constants, one of which is imposing that whether we solve for the g of x, y from the right or from the left, those should both agree on the value of g of x, y at x equal to y. The second one we'll get to because as of right now, it's not going to be too clear why this condition will hold, but it's saying that the difference in the derivatives for our right-hand solution and our left-hand solution should equal 1. And as of right now, like I said, that shouldn't really make sense, but we'll get to it. But let's go ahead and get started. I've talked enough. So we're going to consider two cases. One is going to be x less than y. The other will be x greater than y. So first case, case 1. We'll say x is an element from 0 to y. This is a fancy way of saying x is less than y. Okay, well, it's a homogeneous differential equation. The delta function goes to 0 because x does not equal y. So we get d squared over dx squared g of xy is equal to 0. This 
You should probably know how to solve this differential equation if you're watching a video on Green's function. This is just going, you integrate this twice, so you get a factor of a constant. Integrate it again, you get a constant times x plus another constant. So this is just going to say that g of xy is equal to ax plus b. Now these a's and b's, g is a function of x and y. So that y dependence can actually show up in these constants here. So a and b can actually be functions of y itself. Uh, just to distinguish this from case two, I'm gonna write a subscript L, just so that we know that this is our left-hand solution. Okay, so here's our two constants of integration where a and b are functions of y. Case two says that, so x is an element uh, from y to pi, same deal. It's, it's just going to be a homogeneous differential equation again. So we get d squared g dx squared is equal to zero. So g r, so from the, our right hand solution, since it's x greater than y, uh, of x y is going to equal some c x plus d. Okay. And now let's go ahead and impose our boundary conditions right now. Now each boundary condition will apply to just one of these solutions because we can't apply f of pi to the left-hand solution because this will never get to that point. So this, doesn't, this boundary condition does not apply to the left one and this boundary condition does not apply to the right one. So f of zero equals zero, that tells us that so g of zero comma y is equal to b, which is equal to zero. So b equals zero here. So that reduces our left-hand solution to g of x, y is equal to a, x. Cool, same deal here. Here we have f of pi equals zero, so it's a little bit more uh, involved, I suppose. So we got g of pi, y is equal to c pi, plus d, which is equal to zero, which tells us that d is equal to minus c pi. So g r of x, y is equal to, let's see, so c x minus pi. Okay, now I'm going to underline these equations because these are, we're getting there, we're getting to our, our particular solution. So here's our first one, here is our second one. So here what I did is I just substituted in d equals minus pi into this equation here and then factored out the common factor of c. So awesome, we had our two boundary conditions, we've gotten rid of two of our constants of integration, now we need our other two. The first of which is that at x equal y, these two solutions should be equal. I'm going to write my subscript L here. So at x equal y, we've got a of y is equal to c y minus pi because x equals pi. So we're going to use this and then we're also now going to get to that weird condition that I told you about earlier. The way that we're going to get about it is we're going to take this differential equation here and we're going to integrate it. So we're going to integrate d squared g dx squared dx equal to the integral of the delta function of x minus y dx. Uh, we're going to integrate past the interesting point of x equal to y, so we're going to start from y minus some small value epsilon to y plus some small value epsilon, so this is going to integrate to 1, and then the same thing goes here, so y minus epsilon, y plus epsilon, what we're going to do is we're going to end up taking the limit that epsilon goes to zero. And since these two g's are going to end up being different, we're going to have to take the limits as we approach uh, y from the right and from the left. Okay, so this is equal to d g dx y minus epsilon y plus epsilon. And that's going to be equal to 1. And then we take the limit that epsilon goes to zero, so we've got the limit epsilon goes to zero of, let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead and say epsilon goes to zero from the right of dg 
dx. Okay. And this is assuming that we've already evaluated it at the upper bound minus the limit as epsilon goes to zero from the left of dg dx. That should equal one. We're taking the limit on the right hand side too, but if we're taking the limit of a constant, it's just gonna be equal to itself. So right here, just to be completely you know, clear, we've evaluated this differential at y plus epsilon and y minus epsilon, and then we're taking the limit as epsilon goes to zero after we've evaluated it. And then, since we know that we're gonna have two different functions of g, for if we're past y or if we're before y, we have to specify what direction we're coming from. So here we're doing from the right minus from the left. So really what this whole thing says here is that our derivative of g, our right solution with respect to x, minus dg, our left solution with respect to x, should equal one. I just realized that these should probably be partial derivatives, but just know that g is also a function of y. We're never touching y anywhere in here, so it doesn't really matter, but yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate what these things are. So g prime r, is equal to, well that's just going to equal c, g prime l is just going to equal a. So that says that our other condition is that gr, so c minus a is equal to 1, or c is equal to 1 plus a. Great, now we have everything that we need to find all of our constants. So let's go ahead and plug this into where was our equation? This equation right here. So we have ay is equal to c, which is 1 plus a, times y minus pi, which is equal to y minus pi plus ay uh, minus a pi. These cancel. So we have a y, or a pi rather, is equal to y minus pi. A is equal to y minus pi over a, over, sorry, over pi. Now we can use this to calculate c, which is just one plus a. So one is just pi over pi, so this is just going to be uh, y over pi. Now we can construct our complete solution for g of x, y. We can write it as, um, uh, I forget the name for it at the, at right now, but where it's g of x, y, where we have it in, like, oh, a piecewise function. There we go. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. So for x less than y and then x greater than y. Well, we know for x less than y, it's ax, and a is just y minus pi over pi, so it's y minus pi over pi times x for x less than y. And then we know that it is just, where are you at? right here, c, which is y over pi, times x minus pi, for x greater than y. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We found our Green's function that satisfies this differential equation here. This is actually a pretty simple example. It's just d squared dx squared. They get much more complicated, and even this one took a while to get through. But now that we found the Green's function, it should apply to any arbitrary p of x, which is actually pretty cool. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comment section if you did. See you tomorrow.